everyone, and welcome to Mint Casts, our Mint Press podcast series. I'm Manar Mohawish, editor in chief of Mint Press, and I will be your host. Thanks again for joining today's conversation, where we will be ta- where we will be tackling issues of freedom of the press in the United States and FBI surveillance on journalists, journalism organizations, and and peace activists. Freedom of speech, and more specifically, freedom of the press, are cornerstones of our democracy, and the role of journalists and journalism in general is to act as a government watchdog that hold those in power accountable. But since 9-11, government overreach has spun out of control, and our First Amendment rights are being crushed in the name of national security. The most recent example of this is when the Obama administration seized Associated Press phone records last year which the AP has called a serious interference with AP's constitutional rights to gather and report the news. And joining me today to talk about this and more is a very special guest, Angela Keaton, Director of Operations for Antiwar.com, an online publication devoted to the cause of non-interventionism and advocating an anti-war U.S. foreign policy. Just last week, Antiwar.com filed a lawsuit in federal court demanding the release of records they believe the FBI is keeping on the online magazine and its staff, specifically on founder and editor of Antiwar.com, Eric Garris, and editorial director, Justin Ramiando. And Angela, I know this has probably been a roller coaster of a ride for Antiwar.com, but your staff actually didn't know you were being monitored until a reader notified Eric Garris and Justin Ramiando. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about how you first found out you were being monitored? Well, uh, what happened was a um, someone made a Freedom of Information Act request. It was probably a, a, a person who operated a small blog that covered issues ancillary to the investigations of 9-11. And this person took this Freedom of Information Act request and posted it on one of these online sites, I think it's called Scrib, where you can look, you know, where you can just pl- place large documents for other people to view. And a reader, a reader to our site happened to, you know, Googling around, whatever, found this document online and called my boss. And at this point, um, I think after the shock set in, he spoke to uh, my, our bosses, our founder, Eric Garris. He called Jester Armando and then called the rest of us. And what had happened was this a large document, about a 94-page document, in which there's a 10-page report dated April 30th, 2004, on Justin Armando, Eric Garris, and Antiwar.com, and then another 12 pages of web print outs related to Antiwar.com. Now, um, I, and I can go further, or if you've got some specific questions, we can go into the reasons why and what triggered the well, actual I, I'm I'm really wondering about what was in, what was what kind of information was uh, in those memos you mentioned before. Like there were sections that were redacted. Um, what was in those memos? Well, there's a lot of things. What happened was the Freedom um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is what triggered it, which is really an interesting thing because that what that does is it basically it asks. Um, you know, whether or not antiwar.com is acting on behalf of um, or being funded by a foreign power, which is what triggered that investigation. That's just really, really interesting. The original thing that, that, that got the FBI going was antiwar.com had posted a terrorist suspect list and it had been supplied by the U.S. government to corporations and governmental agencies here and abroad. So, I mean, it wasn't like a top secret list. But it had included one of the postings on the website of an Italian banking association which contained the names of those on a watch list. It was a product of an FBI investigation. And that was what was enough to have the FBI assessment was conducted on the findings discovered on antiwar.com. So a preliminary investigation was filed. And in it, too, there were several things that um, discussing Justin Romano's other articles, and this is d- different topics, but including some of these issues surrounding uh, 9-11 where... You know, it's nothing really conspiratorial, just other various threads of the story that, that have gotten dropped along the way, um, because it's you know, big, big stories and it's pretty easy to do that. Like, like, um, oh, I'm sorry? Like what? Well, I mean, there's the, uh, it refers to the uh, Urban Movers column. It's about a group of Israelis employed in New Jersey Moving Company who arrested on 9-11 on suspicious. They had some connections to the tax. It's a totally different kind of subject, because there's other, at that time, two people kind of confuse it to, with the... Um, there was also stories of, Isra- uh, of Israeli drug rings operating in the U.S., which, while interesting, it probably doesn't directly bear on 9/11. Uh, I'm, I tend to be a pretty cynical person. I'm very cynical about governments, and I just assume that they're all kind of engaging in various forms of organized crimes. And if you've, when you've been reading these things enough, you just pretty much assume that governments and various and people in all different countries are capable of all kinds of pretty 
pretty bad behavior. So, um, well, that was you know those were interesting things. It, get, it, it there there are more th there are more things in it where they're talking about military protests and um, a lot of things that were redacted. So it's it's pretty interesting. Um, what is pretty interesting though? What was pretty what was, what was terribly interesting though is that. Um, as soon as um, one of our friends found out, he went into his contacts at the ACLU office in Washington, D.C., and immediately they referred it to the Northern California ACLU, Anti-War.com is based in San Francisco, and they took the case. And after a year and a half of, of, of investigation on it, filed the case, and what we've discovered uh, is that, and, and, uh, basically the complaint has two parts. Anti-War.com, Eric Ayers, and Justin Armando are asking for two things. One, to, for the government to release all the documents, and two, for the feds to cease investigating antiwar.com. And why do you think uh, antiwar.com is being monitored? What's your personal opinion and the opinions of the editors? Well, I mean, it's all, I mean, anti-war groups have been, been, been monitored in the U.S. since World War I. This is nothing new. I mean, this is something that should be expected. The shock of the investigation was not that it was just the reality of it, the physical hand documents of your worst, most paranoid fears realized in paper. That was the shocking part. Because remember, this happened when we discovered this was August of 2011. This was pre the revelations of the heroic Edward Snowden. That you know, everyone, you know, I mean, we joke about this. And I grew up in a libertarian environment, and I'm used, you know, in certain, you know, a certain kind of comic. You know, comic. Uh, you know, our British sticks where you know, of course, we're being monitored. That's our gimmick. That's our thing. You know, but it's different when you realize, oh, you actually are being monitored, and you're being singled out for special attention by the United States government. Um, Anti-war groups are being monitored in 2010, 2011, and so on in the Midwest area, and, and Minnesota is a place with so many, so many great peace activists, but and in Chicago as well. But people who, um, anti-war activists who took a special interest in, in uh, rights for Palestinians um, received extra special attention uh, a few years back. And that's a fairly big story. It's enough of a story that you know, mainstream papers actually comment on it. But these sort of things do go on. I mean, this is nothing really new. It's just a question of getting the general public outraged about it. And post-Snowden, I think people are, are a little more cynical. I mean, not everyone, and there's a lot of people who don't who, who really haven't internalized these things yet. But there are enough people of good conscience and moral will and people who do believe in very basic you know, human rights, like the right to be left alone uh, and not be harassed by the United States government, that, and that's just a natural right. I mean, that's just inherent in being an adult. Like, yes, you have a right to not, not have your words and, mm -hmm. and your thoughts monitored, which is what is going on here. Um, and because of what we received from the ACLU back and forth, their back and forth between the government, we know as recently as 2012, antiwar.com has been being investigated. So that means, my, this is my assumption, obviously I can't prove that I can only speak to the last set of documents that I saw, but if we're being monitored as recently as 2012, I have no reason to think that we're still not being monitored. Okay. And when you approached the FBI for these documents the first time, what was their response to your organization? They, and then this is going. I have to. I have to reread all the the filings and back and forth. But initially, they denied having any files. And then with the next set of batches, they released a whole set of files. Most of it redacted. Mm -hmm. But one thing that did that the one thing that has happened so far, though it wasn't specifically requested, I think not in documents, but they the FBI has since made. One correction to Eric Garris's docket, uh, Eric Garris's file, where <laughs> this is very very funny, um, because and, and the reasons why we do this isn't because we're violating anarchist principles, but just because we live in a society that's run by the state, you have to follow certain of their rules. But um, antiwar.com used to receive many many threats. So you receive less. So we receive fewer threats now, but we used to receive a lot of different threats. And one of the threats Eric Garris thought was, was frightening enough that he needed to call the FBI, and he did, and it made sense. Well, that was recorded by the FBI agent as Eric Garris making a threat to the FBI, not antiwar.com report reporting a threat of people's, you know, staff members' lives being made, you know, to the FBI. And what, so, what, was, what was that threat? Could you say? Um, they used to, I, you know, I, I don't remember all of, you know, different was all these, and I, you know, I've gotten very few of these in the past few years. But it used to be, I mean, occasionally we get letters or emails telling us, you know, they'll, you know, hack up the site and kill everyone. 
um, how seriously to take it. I don't take those things very seriously, but you, it probably helps to have a paper trail. Um, and you know, Eric is very responsible this way, and obviously he's going to take any threats against staff members and the site fairly seriously. So, you know, it's been. A, I mean, I, I I probably can find that information out, but I just like a lot of this. I just I can function better when I'm not constantly obsessing over it. And they, the FBI recorded it as Eric making a threat against the FBI. Now, since then, that has been corrected. Okay. That with a note. Um, but that's so far the only relief that's been experienced back and forth. The ACLU is, I mean, this is a long, this case is going to go on for several years. This is not going to be, you know, this is not going to be easily resolved because obviously the FBI is going to take its own, the Department of Justice will take its own sweet time on this. And have they said, like, how long these documents will take to be released to you? I mean, have they said that they even will release them to you? What has, has, what has the response been from the FBI um, on this investigation? Just, you know, just what, they, what they've been willing to release to the ACLU, which is, you know, bits and pieces. So, and, they, and uh, recently, I mean, and the case is something that the ACLU is, you know, is highly focused on in Northern California. They have other, they have other people uh, from outside also working on this case. It's a big deal. Um, but it's going to be a long time before there's any actual relief, if ever. I mean, they may never release all the documents, and they may never stop investigating us. There's no, you know, there's no guarantee here. Um, and we're certainly, they're certainly not stating that they are, so we have no reason to think that they ever will. But there are documents being received. But remember, most of these are, I mean, when, I was, when, when Eric sends me the files, they're mm -hmm. redacted heavily. I mean, it's, I mean, I might as well be receiving blank pieces of paper with scribbles on them here, here, here. It doesn't, I mean, they're not, it's it's not necessarily enlightening. So, how do you think the consolidation of journalism organizations specifically have contributed to the demise of the fourth estate, which is journalism, and has contributed to the idea that uh, journalist organizations, you know, have to fear for speaking the truth? Well, you know, you mentioned the AP. I mean, it's 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 left wing groups. It's AP. It's you know the New York Times. It's Fox News. Uh, in, they're all under everyone, you know, all the major journalists or you know, anyone that could have any influence is going to be investigated. You know, it's the demise of journalism. You know, I, I, tend, to, I tend to be a cynical person and I do, do sort of remember, you know, when I was younger seeing um, the documentary version, I believe, of, of Chomsky's uh, Manufacturing Consent. So obviously these institutions may inherently have problems. I mean, if you're bringing journalists in from certain social classes and they all go to the same schools, and they all kind of intermarry with each other. They're all going to have roughly the same attitudes on things. It's not a conspiracy. It's mostly just consensus when you're getting, you know, groups of people who they think the same way because they're not very creative or interesting people. Um, but you know, I mean, not all. You know, I mean, it's it's interesting how that. You know, I was just thinking back last night. I remember that. You know, it wasn't that long ago when Christopher Hedges was, uh, you know, in, you know, a New York Times, you know, a New York Times foreign correspondent. The Journalism itself, though, has been very clearly in the arm of the empire. Because while you, there's a certain amount of dissenting views that you can find, and it's sort of the game is sort of played. You know, there's a difference between MSNBC and Fox. But when you're actually paying attention, the differences between, let's say, what's what MSNBC and what Fox is, are very, very minor. It just framed differently, but the consensus is the same. And when it comes to empire, which is the most important thing that the state does. I mean, the U.S. empire is a big, large thing. It's the biggest empire in human history. It's the most important thing the state does. That it's extremely protective of it. So you don't hear different points of view ever. You've never heard different, really, very, very, you rarely hear different points of view in mainstream journalism on it. But I mean, the reasons are much more complicated and pre-exist, you know, constant government surveillance and interference. Um, it's a lack of certainly diversity in the newsroom. I mean, you're drawing the same kind of people all the time to tell the same kind of stories. You're not going to get anyone questioning things. So when it comes to let's say when back let's say go back to the coverage of Iraq, you didn't really hear many voices telling saying this is a really a bad idea. Okay, and I know that you had mentioned uh, the surveillance of anti-war groups specifically um, at the very beginning of this conversation. Um, what what groups have been surveilled by the by the FBI? Well, this goes goes back to to World War One. I. I mean, everybody from the Quakers to um, different, you know, to the groups I mentioned earlier in the Midwest that are certainly being that are being surveyed have been under some kind of surveillance. I mean, this is I mean, if you go back to the '60s quite a bit, um, a lot of um, 
black liberation groups, this is all part of that, people became more aware of just how much government surveillance was going on by any possible centers. So it's a normal thing to assume that if you're really active, whether the group be ANSWER, or whether it be Catholic workers or whatever, I mean, it doesn't matter the ideological flavor of an anti-war group or what religious group it's associated with, it will be investigated. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a given. I don't know how, I mean, it, you'd have to, one would have to be extremely both naive as well as just ignorant of, especially in the post-Snowden era, I mean, we have to pretty much assume that all of it, you know, I mean, all, all anti-war work is being surveyed to some degree. Now, whether or not this means you're named on a list, well, I've never, you know, I fly all over and I've never been denied flying. I've been built up a lot, but I've never been denied my ability to fly. So I don't know how, I mean, like any particular one of us is not important, but the institutions themselves can be very important. And to be fair, Eric Garrison and Justin Armando have been engaging in libertarian activism and peace activism for several decades. So, I mean, it, it, it shouldn't have been a shock to anyone that they specifically had files. But the specific, but the reasons why they were investigating antiwar.com and what, what triggered those things are very, very curious. So, um, and I do, I will have, you know, if everyone wants, anyone wants links we can talk more about, you know, so people can see for themselves and go into detail. And I would also, too, give you a little bit of insight on the, um, the giant Freedom Information Act request, which is mostly on the uh, dancing Israelis, is what they call that story now. Um, but as I said, there's, there's overlaps between a D, that and a DEA story that was, while interesting, was somewhat over here, not the main part of that. So what does this all mean for the state of journalism? I know that obviously Edward Snowden and Glenn Greenwald alike have you know, brought attention to this issue, but what does this mean for independent uh, news organizations that have very little funding and uh, you know, supposedly very little support? But you know, all these, all these organizations do exist, whether it's antiwar.com or Mint Press, and like we can name several other of our friends and allies who have small outlets that do quite a bit of work. I mean, I remember when Glenn Greenwald was just a blogger, and since then, you know, he's had made this transition through, you know, uh, revealing by one being very morally consistent, and two, you know, making really great scoops and getting things in front of people that people really need to look at. And the Edward Snowden story—I mean, that's uh, people like Snowden, people like Chelsea Manning, um, which obviously had helped, you know, with, you know, why Julian, Ass Julian Assange presumably. Um, these people, extremely brave. It's, and what they've done is very, very important. And that's the real journalism. I mean, journalism is supposed to be finding out the things that the state or, you know, or large organizations connected to the state don't want you to find out. That's what journalism is. What goes on, and you know, I always have CNN or MSNBC or Fox in the back behind me in my office, that what's going on there is not journalism. It's public relations. And it's and it's really really important. And people say, oh, they don't watch the mainstream news. It's very important you look at what what, main, what the mainstream news is saying about U.S. foreign policy because people are getting their attitudes and ideas from somewhere. And one of the you know we can talk about root causes of war. One of those root causes, is, of course, racism. And until people are really honest about what's portrayed on television and movies, particularly, I mean, the groups change, the ethnicities and the religions and the races change, but it's always creating an other that makes it easy to, to kill and destroy. Um, what the United States says about Arabs and Muslims and what we learn through our, you know, the culture is absolutely hideous, but we take it in and that makes it very easy for us to not care what goes on in Afghanistan or Iraq because those are not really people there. I mean, they might as well be on Mars. What, do you th well, what does anti-war uh, cover specifically? We cover all the areas of the world where the U.S. has a hand in, in destruction and occupation, colonialism, and torture, and just general mischief. Um, now, some of our big, it depends on what, you know, what is above our fold. You know, we have our, main, our top stories every day. Sometimes that, you know, this week I'll have to do with Ukraine, but that can change at any moment. You know, Syria, uh, what's going on in Syria is obviously horrible and hard. It needs to be constantly monitored because you don't want the U.S. to make things even worse. Um, in an already terrible situation, but we have quite a bit of coverage on Latin America and Mexico, and it's really important because you know, the drug war issues are part of the empire, and that's where there is overlap in, in those matters. Um, we certainly need to keep our eyes out on what the U.S. is doing. as a lot of presence in Asia, bases in Asia, and there's Barack Obama's uh, Asian, Asia pivot, um, which people are concerned about, but my, I think the, the hot spot people really need to watch and be really wary of what is what Barack Obama is doing in Africa. That's really some place that people tend to ignore, but it's really the U.S. The United States presence in Africa is is, is not good. Okay.
And I'm, you know, I'm really wondering about the pressure that you guys have all received at antiwar.com. How has this affected your editorial editorial process, if it has? I, you know, I'm I'm just asking, um, and your relationship with your readers has this affected that in any way? It's definitely affected our relationship with our readers and donors. Uh, we've had major donors say, "I just can't do this anymore." Um, and it's not because they they don't know what they're fearing, but they're afraid. And it's fair because when you're it's one thing to, yes, yeah, so say we're all being monitored, this conversation's being monitored, and they know that, but it's one thing to kind of have that as an abstract. It's another thing to really internalize that, what that means, because that means that, yes, literally all your electronic communications are, are, all, are being recorded. Now, that may, means it's on, a, it's on a, you know, people say, well, it's on a computer record somewhere, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, in our case, the case of antiwar.com, somebody's paying attention, someone's listening. And most recent, most recent filings that we saw, we know as recently as 2012, antiwar.com was under investigation. So it, it cut, forced us to cut our staff already, in, you know, already small staff in half, um, which has created a lot more stress on everyone. And its funding is much more difficult now. But in terms of our editorial policy, you know, we keep taking chances. I mean, what are they going to do? Arrest us? I, they're not going to arrest us. We need to, I mean, we feel obligated to keep, as much as we can afford to do so, putting this information out there. Okay. And, I, you know, my last question is, you know, how has this affected you specifically, Angela? Um, I tend uh, to... You know, you mentioned that you're, you know, a libertarian at heart, and I know that your readers are, you know, of all political backgrounds, right. but, you know, how has this affected your perspective on... Uh, the state of surveillance or uh, the state of war? It's, it reminds me why I have to do what I do every day. I choose to work at antiwar.com. I, I normally would not suggest people work at nonprofits or in libertarian movement. I don't think it's necessarily the best environment for people who, who, who have things to contribute. But this is a very unusual case. What we do at antiwar.com is different from what everyone else is doing. And no disrespect to my brothers and sisters on the left in the anti-war movement, but we're the only one who does this particular thing. So we're very, very proud of our work, and we're going to continue to do it. But it, it no, it just it, it, it's it's a bummer to not get as much, you know, not bring in as much money. It's hard hard to cut corners. It's hard to work in extra hours every day when you already are putting in a lot of hours. But the alternative would be not doing it. And I don't, no, I mean, me personally, I mean, I will keep doing this. It may not be my only job. It may not be my main job sometimes, sometimes but it, it is it is what I do every day. And what, you know, this is my last question for you. What advice do you give for other journalists and news organizations? I mean, we talked a little bit about the anti-war community, I mean, and smaller independent news organizations who are most likely, as you mentioned, um, are also being monitored. What advice do you have for other journalists and news organizations? Be cynical and be boldly cynical and constantly ask questions. Assume bad motives on the part of everyone until you get the right answers. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not really a beat, but there you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Angela, for your time. Uh, it has been extremely interesting talking to you. Um, and the outcome of this whole case should be interesting, and I think we're all going to be on standby watching it as it develops. Um, you can find this podcast through our Mint Press iTunes channel and on our website. But the conversation is far from over, as we'd like to hear more from our readers and listeners on the subject of FBI surveillance on journalists and peace activists. Tweet at us using hashtag MintCast and tell us what you think. You can also post on our Facebook page in our comments section uh, to our pin post featuring this podcast. Thank you so much for listening.